thank you very much for the invitation to talk about the use of technology in supporting self-management um, and technology comes in all shapes and sizes uh, but there are very key reasons why it's important to embrace uh, technology and um, so we are all um, and every single one of us on this call will um, relate to the first box here is we are all living busier and busier lives, making it more difficult to attend face to face patient education sessions or um, opportunities to learn about uh, disease self management. So uh, there's a, that's a particularly good reason for finding other ways of doing things, but it also empowers people to play a, a key role in their health management if they feel that they have uh, access to the information at a at times that works for them but also they have can be interactive in keeping track of their disease through different uses of technology and that is all very key to self-management and um, it supports the health service as well the more engaged people are with their own disease self-management we know actually helps the uh, the health service to deliver the best care and using technology where we can have interaction between the individual and the health records helps with uh, health data but it also helps with um, being able to fast track those who are in need of help in a more timely way and it is uh, technologies now is open to everybody so it gives access to to all regardless of ge geographic uh, location regardless of um you know time available they can actually access information in a more far more timely way and many of the technologies that we're looking to embrace or have em uh, embraced is um able to connect people together uh, giving uh, that certainly during this uh, recent crisis has reduced the feeling of isolation for so many people having that connectivity of um, being able to, to talk to others and, and connect with others. Um, and of course, as I said, uh, part of the supporting the health service is actually gathering data in real time. Uh, anonymous aggregated data that can give us a real insight into what is happening with so many people living with RA. There are pros and cons. Uh, there are pros and cons for everything we do in life. And I've touched on some of these, but you can see that the, pro, the, the advantages certainly outweigh the disadvantages, but we mustn't ignore the, that there are some drawbacks to um, relying too heavily on health technology but just to go through these um, I'm not going to read them all out but of course as I said ge ge geograph uh, geography can be a real barrier sometimes for accessing good self-management care and you know if you're living in a very rural part of the of the country where travel to uh, places it can be difficult being able to access through um, through internet, through Wi-Fi, the information that you need to be able to um, take better control of your disease, you know, it is really important. It also is a lot easier for patient organisations like ourselves to keep things updated. Uh, so you can change things quite rapidly on a, 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 a digital format uh, so that it's, it can be changed immediately when you're relying on a lot of printed materials. Um, you know, you, you run the risk of once it's printed, it could go out of date quite quickly because the whole uh, management of room to, uh, immune mediated conditions and, and uh, rheumatological conditions are changing so quickly, the, the treatments and, and um, therapies. So using technology to, to be harness uh, the opportunity, the platforms to share self-management techniques, um, it does make it a lot easier to update and keep them updated in a very timely way. Um, using multiple channels again it's not a one size fits all uh, it is cost and resource efficient as well to try and run um, patient education programs where you have to to 
have somebody travel to that venue, you have the costs of, you know, perhaps the hire of a, a, a room in a hotel or a, a community hall or something like that. Um, and as well, it means it's more cost uh, effective and efficient for the individuals to attend uh, if they can do so from the comfort of their own home, if it's a self-management uh, module that they're going to complete. Uh, there is no cost of travel, parking, etc. Um, there is the ability to also uh, translate uh, a lot of the information that is delivered through um, self-management online uh, resources into different languages or to have uh, interactive uh, ability as well within that. But as I also uh, mentioned, it's it sometimes can be incredibly valuable to capture real world data, how people are responding uh, in real time to um, their self-management modules and connecting, as I said, with people as well. But we can't lose the sight of there are some negatives to relying heavily on health technology, and that is the lack of socialization. Um, while it is great that you can connect people and they can even see each other, we can see each other on this call today, you can see me, and but it isn't quite the same as being in the same environment together. Um, and lots of people find that very difficult to, to connect with people through technology and they miss that face-to-face that -face interaction. And not everybody is, you know, tech savvy um, you know even nowadays there are lots of people who find it a real struggle to access or use uh, laptops or um, iPads etc and so they may be fearful if that's not the environment they've worked in um, that you know how to use and how to access the information and that the resources um, and if there's too much reliance on technology it may lead to patients slipping through the cracks. If there's a, there's a real push at the moment for uh, more virtual consultations by uh, clinicians with their patients, but of course, you can while you might be able to see them on a screen, you can't actually see the way they move, and um, there may be um, some patients that will put on a brave face when they're on a camera like this but they may not, uh, uh, their, the way their um, mobility is affected by, the, by their disease would not be being picked up by the clinician if they could see them walking down a corridor or how they were sitting, et cetera, or how they might grasp a, a pen or something like that. So too much reliance on um, technology for self-management can, it needs to be in balance with still the opportunity for some face-to-face -face. and of course there is always the concern about data privacy and how data is being stored who's having access to that data and these are all things to be mindful of when working with third uh, parties when setting up uh, different health technologies to um, help with self-management is you know where is that data being stored? How is it being uh, seen by others and how it's being shared? So there are, you know, what technology is used in self-management? Well, you know, like we are on this today, we're in Teams, but you're, so everybody will be uh, well used to using Zoom. It's a great way of seeing people and, and having conversations with them and learning from each other. Um, People use iPads for, to keep their um, medical records and medical records are now being kept uh, very much in um, digital format. Of course, you've got websites like our own. Uh, I've already mentioned we've got um, we've been doing a number of Zoom uh, self-management um, topics on our uh, during this whole COVID crisis. And that's something now that's here to stay is a great way of sharing up-to-date information through uh, about how to manage your disease through Facebook lives etc um, and um, and then being able people can watch them back at any uh, in the future um, we uh, at NRAS have also introduced a little uh, chat bot <clears throat> to our um, 
to our website. So again, people with specific questions about their specific um, uh, problems that they might be having with their rheumatoid arthritis can actually put a question to our little um, uh, lady called Sue that comes up on our website and that then can be tailored to their needs. And while it's an ongoing, it's, it's constantly needing to be uh, fed if you like with information but the more we the more questions we get the more tailored we can make those answers and again that's part of giving the control to the individual about finding the right answers to manage their own disease in a very timely way uh, without actually having to pick up the phone and actually speak to someone and again using harnessing technology means that uh, I mentioned about translation and being able to share information in different formats. So uh, we have a whole section on our NRAS website that is in Hindi uh, and we've been uh, utilising a lot more video content and again being able to share that with the South Asian community here in the UK has been incredibly helpful. But peer support plays a huge part in good self-management um, and one of the, the bigger communities you can see there we've got you know 20, nearly uh, 29, over 29,000 members of our online um, community where they support and share information to help better management of their disease learning different techniques from other people about coping mechanisms etc um, and again that's something that's available 24 hours a day seven days a week so it gives that um, flexibility to the individual living with RA that they're able to access that sort of um, timely uh, support and information to to help them cope with everyday living with with rheumatoid arthritis but we do have some structured um, programs. Uh, we are moving our six week self management program. We're currently working on that onto an online modular system. Um, we're just about to go out for testing of that at the moment, so I can't share that with you today. But we, it's, it'll be along the same lines as our online interactive um, self management program on cardiovascular risk. and. Um, there is a little animation that's going to come up. Um, you won't hear what's being said, but I will talk you through it. But this is where individuals, we know that people with RA are at a much higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And being able to actually um, assess the level of risk and then be signposted into what they can do to reduce their risk of cardiovascular disease, and but also set their own goals and their own program as to what they're going to do to reduce that risk. And so this is, a, um, it's called Love Your Heart. Uh, so there are interactive videos like this. This is one of our members talking about, you know, how do you know what your disease is? You have little click boxes. So you can go to different sections throughout the, um, the program, the online interactive program and put your own goals in. But of course, apps now play a massive part in uh, self-management and there are thousands and thousands of health apps out there for all sorts of conditions. So from a charity's point of view, from a small charity's point of view, it can be quite daunting knowing which companies you should work with alongside. Uh, because we get approached by many, many different companies. But we've been working, we did our due diligence on uh, a number of um, partners that we've worked with recently. And this is uh, a company called Ampersand, who has who is got the patient portal that we're promoting and help to uh, provide information into, but also there's the clinician portal and the idea is if the hospital also signs up that they can marry up their clinical records with the patient's records so they can measure the um, 
patient reported outcomes, patient experience measures, etc. But it puts the owner ownership really on the individual patient to be able to measure how they're doing over a period of time. They can take photos, they can get information, they can um, be able to keep track of their disease over a long period of time. And especially nowadays with so few face to face um, clinic appointments happening, it's even more important for individuals to take control of their disease self-management. And again, apps, different people like them, some other people don't, um, but we've worked very hard to make this simple, easy and easy to follow and, and be able to share that information if necessary with their clinicians as well. So the My Arthritis app, um, people can build their own personal health record. They can find ways to take back control so they can get, uh, there's a whole library of uh, curated resources that they're signposted to. Um, they can connect directly through the app with our helpline here at NRAS. So through the app, they can actually make a call or send an inquiry. And they can also set reminders. Of course, one of the important things is about um, keeping up to date with your medications, appointments, etc. So there is a, a diary system in there as well. So it's a very nice, easy uh, system. And for the, the clinicians can also, if they've bought the, um, if they've bought into the uh, using the app, they can actually. Uh, send appointments through the app to the individual to uh, reminders for them to attend uh, blood monitoring appointments, etc. So it's a very um, uh, useful app and people are responding very well to it. It's still in its early days, but uh, we're hoping to see a lot more people take that up. But it's not for everybody. So there are other apps as well. Um, we have been working with another company that uh, has just been awarded an award from NHS Digital, um, and this is called Good Boost. Now, they originally started uh, with an exercise um, self-management app that would be used in hydrotherapy pools. So these are waterproof iPads that they would have on the side of the pool where the individual could actually look at their, their put in their personal details and there would be a, a personalized program of exercise for them to do while in the pool. Um, so overseen by a, um, a supervisor, so uh, perhaps a physio. But of course, because of COVID, all the swimming pools, etc., were all closed. So they very rapidly have worked to moving a lot of the exercises to land based exercises. And again, we've launched this already and uh, it's proving very successful. So people can not only do their own individual exercise program, but they can actually join up with others. Uh, so you could have a local group. They may not be able to meet locally but they could all log on at the same time and be doing the exercises together in real time. And that does encourage people to take part and, and uh, keep their level of movement up. So again, a great use of technology. Um, and uh, hopefully it does give, as the, it says on the label, a good boost to, to self-management. Excuse me, that's our uh, test for our fire alarm, but uh, it is only a test. I don't have to run for the hills. Um, and the other app that we have is called Rumor Buddy. This is more about um, well-being and looking after mental health as well as their, their symptom control. And again, it's uh, it being used mostly by our JIA uh, families. So those with juvenile idiopathic arthritis find this very helpful. Parents find it helpful to sit with their child who has JIA <clears throat> and be able to sort of move the, the smiley face back and forth as to how they're feeling and then talk about um, what it is that they're having difficulty with on that particular day. And again, this is a, about putting some of the, the control back into the individual's hands uh, so they can have that conversation with the parent um, to, and then the parent can maybe bring that up with their clinician. 
And the DAS app that's been around for a long time, I'm sure I've shared this on many occasions with many of you. But um, again, because of COVID, we're now revamping uh, this because it is going to be even more important that people can measure their own disease activity score in their own home and be able to keep a track of that, especially if they're not seeing uh, their clinician for quite a long time or they're doing virtual consultations uh, because they won't be able to have their joints examined. So we will be relaunching the, the, the next version of Know Your DAS app very, very soon. And just to give you an idea of how that works, hopefully this should go. Don't worry, you won't be able to hear anything on this. That, that's fine. It's just to show you how the, the app actually works. So you'll be able to have, uh, there's a health diary there that you can put in how you're feeling on that particular day, how active you've been on the day, what your fatigue levels are like, what the swelling on certain joints, you can put some little notes in, um, can even take photographs of the particular joint that is uh, giving you uh, problems at the time. And that all can be shared with your healthcare professional. And if you don't know how to do your DAS, there are little instructive uh, videos to show how do you examine the um, for tender and swollen joints. And then, of course, if you have the blood test results as well, you can put those in. But even if you haven't got up to date blood test results, the algorithm can give you an indication of where your DAS score is. And it gives a full explanation about the role of DAS in the treatment pathways. And there are also um, a new section on there to help people remember to take their medications when they're due and um, it helps with adherence. And the last thing I wanted to really share with you is our new online referral system that is all about embedding good self-management techniques right from the very beginning of somebody's journey with rheumatoid arthritis. So we have a new service called <coughs> sorry, New to RA Right Start. This is where the individual, when they're newly diagnosed, will be sitting with their nurse or their clinician. Uh, there's an online referral form and they will get permissions, all GDPR compliant, and they will be referred into our service. And the first step then is that somebody from our helpline will actually call the individual. And what it really has shown is, is the success has been shown in that instead of putting the onus on the individual to make that first step, that, that first um, call to the patient organisation, it's embedding it into the treatment pathway. This is part of your therapy. This is part of your treatment that you will have this intervention from NRAS. And that normalizes things. And what it, it then means that we can tailor uh, an information pack that will go out to the individual, um, depending on where they, you know, what sort of lifestyle they have. You know, may, they might need information about how do they talk to their employer, about living with RA. And again, this is giving them all the right self-management tools in a very timely way. And as I said, embedded into that whole treatment pathway. Um, and the form looks like this. So it comes up on, on the screen. The uh, nurse has got the patient by them or the doctor has the patient with them, gets all the details there and that comes straight into our referral system. And then it's picked up here and an appointment is made for a telephone call, as I said, with our helpline uh, staff. And that's proving really, really incredibly successful. And one of the probably the highlights for me in particular is um, I'm finding that we are now actually talking to far more men with RA, newly diagnosed men, than we were ever doing before this service. And I don't know, you know, no disrespect to any of the men listening on this call, but you, you know, it's kind of more difficult to reach out and ask for help. 
um, or to even admit even perhaps to yourselves that you might need a bit of help at the beginning of this journey with with a long term condition. What this is doing is because it's it's been a referral, the same as you'd get a referral to a physio or a podiatrist, it's seen as part of the treatment pathway. So it's perfectly all right. This is part of your treatment that somebody from NRAS will call and then we start that dialogue. And it has proved in, immensely uh, successful for many, many people, men in particular that said, well, I wouldn't have asked that question, only that, you know, it's been prompted. So again, it's giving them the techniques about good self-management techniques right from the very beginning of their journey. And we've been very fortunate that it is now recommended. The Right Start programme is now part of the recommendations in the uh, as part of the NICE which is the uh, National Institute for Health and Care Excellence learning database. So that's where uh, clinicians will go to to know what's available, what resources. So we're, we're very pleased about that. And again, it's just normalizing, embedding good self-management right in, in, the, in the pathway and using technology to do that. Um, so technology can be your friend. You can, but you, I think if any words of advice uh, is to do due diligence with um, with any company that you're going to work with, it does, it, there's a different expertise that perhaps we certainly don't necessarily have within NRAS. And so you have to be very clear that you can trust the, the third party that you're going to work with on uh you know, because it can be very, very expensive mistakes if we don't get it right. So do due diligence on who you're going to partner with. Get some recommendations from other organisations similar to yourself. Um, and, you know, probably not say yes to everything, which I think is something we, we've learnt uh, from bitter experiences. We've said yes to too many things and maybe spread ourselves too thinly. And we're probably just be a little bit more fussy about what you, you do and what te technology you embrace uh, going forward as part of your self-management uh, resourcing. That's all I have to share with you at the moment. Uh, I believe we're going to do questions after this. So I think I have now stopped sharing. I hope I've stopped sharing. Yes, and back over to you. Thank you very much, Claire. It's a very interesting uh, presentation. We have about one, two questions, but it's going to be an answer at the end of uh, also Grace's presentation. Zima, your turn. Thank you very much, Kati. I will now introduce Grania, who will be doing the second presentation. Grania O'Leary is the Chief Executive of Arthritis Ireland, where she is leading the strategy of the charity to be one of the leading patient-centric health charities in Ireland. Grania developed and implemented Arthritis Ireland's suite of patient support services, including the innovative Stanford University Self-Management Programme, a national helpline and a national physical activity programme in partnership with the Irish Society for Chartered Physiotherapists. She serves as a board member of the Disability Federation of Ireland and the Irish Platform for Patient Organisation Science and Industry. The title of Grunia's presentation is Living Well with Arthritis and Related Conditions. In your hands, Grunia. Can people hear me first of all? I just want to check that I'm, I'm, I can be heard. Yes, you can. You, you are can, heard. that's fine, mm -hmm. yes. Um, okay, so thank you. Um, I'm yeah, I'm going to talk um, about, um, I suppose, one of our it's, it's probably our most impactful service that we deliver in Arthritis Ireland, and it's called Living Well with Arthritis and Related Conditions. But uh, as with the, the title of, of today's webinars, um, I will also be speaking about how we have adapted um, during the pandemic to bring to continue to bring this program uh, to people living with arthritis um, around Ireland. So uh, if you wouldn't mind moving on the slide there. Yeah, so so just to tell you a little bit about so many of you on on this will probably be familiar already with this program. So 
it's a it's a six week um, self management course where um, a group of people uh, living with all types of rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases come together. So they um, it's not a particular type of arthritis. It's it's any type really, and they come together for uh, once a week for a session of about two and a half hours in duration. Um, usually, we would offer this program to uh, a maximum of sort of eighteen people. Um, it's a licensed program, which means that um, it's been, I suppose, developed over a number of years and, and um, refined over a number of years. Um, and there are there has research um, been done really on this program to show that it actually works um, for people with arthritis. It's taught by a team of two trained leaders. Now, in Ireland, we always have what we call a peer delivering. So that means somebody actually living with the condition themselves. And um, usually there are two people with the condition delivering, but sometimes it might be a healthcare professional who ha is experienced in the area of rheumatology that might co-deliver with, with the patient. And really, it's all about providing the tools to people um, that are needed in the day to day life with a chronic condition such as arthritis. Interestingly, the programme is always delivered in community settings as well, so it's never delivered in what I would call, if you like, clinical um, clinical settings. Um, so it is delivered in community settings, so that might be, you know, a community centre, um, a church hall, places like that. Um, so we really try and get into the heart of communities um, around our country here in Ireland and bring it to people, you know, outside of the major urban areas as well. We usually in Ireland here, we deliver about 40 of these courses a year. So that allows us to get to to reach about 750 people with this six week intervention. Next slide. So who do we deliver to? I mentioned this at the beginning, so um, so it's living well with arthritis, but we actually deliver to a very broad range of rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. So really we're looking at, you know, disease that the big ones, I suppose, like osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, all other types of inflammatory arthritis, but also some of the names you see there on the slide. So lupus, um, Bichette, you know, scleroderma, um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, Raynaud's, uh, polymyalgia rheumatica. So we really reach out to the very broad um, family of RMDs. Okay, move on. So just to give you, bring you through, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on this so that we can kind of move to how we've adapted since March, since the pandemic hit. Um, but we started in Arthritis Ireland delivering this programme back in 2006, so it's 14 years ago. And we, um, we basically decided as an organization that we needed to, I suppose, um, develop um, our supports and services much to a much greater level to really get um, a, a high level of support to be available for people living with arthritis in Ireland. So we trained our first group of leaders. So leaders are the people who deliver this program. So we trained our first group in, 20, in 2006. And then in the autumn of 2006, we offered our first programs to people in various communities around the country. Um, as time went on and, and that the first year proved to be a big success where we had even huge waiting lists for the programs uh, for people to access them. So we needed to be able to increase our capacity to train more leaders to be enable us to offer more programs. So you can see a picture there in the third uh, panel along there. So there's myself with my co-trainer and colleague, um, Claire Kenevy, who would be known to many of you. So Claire lives at Rheumatoid Arthritis for many years, and we both trained as what we call master trainers. So this is sort of like a train the trainer. So it enabled us to train leaders as and when we need them. Um, and that enabled us then in, 20, in 2007, 2008, 2009 onwards to actually train more people um, internally within our organization so we could reach more people out in the community. Um, in, in 2013, it just, you know, we were a few years into it and we really wanted to put a spotlight on the difference this program had made um, to people living with arthritis. It really was um, quite amazing the feedback that we actually got from patients um, all around the country about the difference that this program had made. And I'll, I'll give you some quotes later on um, uh, from that. And we published a report on which was called the case for self-management. 
So it gave a background to why self-management is important. And um, it placed it in an Irish context as well, where, you know, our health service um, has many challenges and um, rheumatology waiting lists are very long. Um, and, you know, our population growth is such that we're on a trajectory towards um, an increasingly older population, which will ultimately mean more people with RMDs in our population. So we were really making this case for the support of self-management at a national level. Um, and we, we actually ran a sort of high level conference on the whole area of self-management. In 2016, we, we changed over to what they call the chronic disease version of the program. So for a number of years in the, in, at the start, we actually um, delivered an arthritis specific program. Um, but we were one of the few organizations worldwide that were actually delivering this arthritis specific program. And in 2016, we learned that that arthritis program wouldn't really be supported with you know, further research or any refinement going forward. So it really meant we had to move over to a more generic program, um, which at, at first we, we entered into with a bit of trepidation because we felt, well, look, we're used to delivering an arthritis specific program. It works very well for our cohort. But then we quickly learned that really this program isn't about, it's not a disease education program. It's really an education program around self-management and the skills and tools that are needed for self-management and arthritis are really one and the same for other chronic conditions as well. Uh, so we began this journey with the chronic disease version of the program. Um, and we've been doing that for um, the last few years um, and also training uh, more, more leaders as well. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about during 2020, of course, that, you know, by March of this year, um, we were faced with a huge challenge in terms of, you know, what we would do with our most important service that we offer and how we would continue to offer that uh, to people living with arthritis. So I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. So if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide. So just to give you um, an indication um, of where we're at in terms of um, how many we've trained and how many people we've reached since we started the programme. So we've trained 107 leaders since 20, uh, 2006. Um, as what happens, I suppose, with any training programme, you do get att attrition over the years for a variety of reasons. So I suppose at the moment we would say we have 60 active leaders. Um, and we're working to increase that at the moment. We still have our two master trainers and that network has allowed us to run 420 six week programs and um, to just under 7000 participants. So I guess if you like, we're, we're a population in Ireland of um, four and a half million, 4.8 million. And um, it's still a drop in the ocean. But this is what I would call a very intensive form of support and um, through a six week intervention. Um, so we're probably in terms of being able to deliver 40 courses a year, we're probably at the, the upper limit of what we can, what we have capacity to deliver in our organization. So move on to the next slide. So in terms of just some of the key learnings for us as organizations and, and for other organizations on this webinar today, who might be considering going down this path. Some of our learnings is that, well, this, this doesn't come cheap, first of all. So what enabled us to um, kick off this program was certainly um, the availability and the sourcing of core funding. So our health service provides core funding um, for the delivery of this program and has done since 2006. There's been variations in the level of that funding from year to year. Um, and we have sometimes got um, some industry support for particular initiatives that we want to embark on um, in the area of self-management. Um, so core funding is essential. The other thing is that um, we recruited um, a full time program coordinator um, and that is essential for the scale that we're operating at. Um, we need a full time uh, staff person in our organization to coordinate the programs, to set up the courses, to um, you know, identify and fix slots with our with our leader network around the country um, you know, to recruit the participants, to select the venues. And to promote the courses, it's a, it's a full time job. And um, the other thing we found is that really you need a strong multifaceted recruitment strategy and budget. And um, so Claire mentioned in her presentation about the fact, well, you know, not everybody's online. So 
you know, online works very well for us in terms of recruiting a, a certain cohort, but it doesn't reach everybody. So we we tend to have a very uh, multifaceted recruitment strategy um, for getting our participants, which can vary from, you know, Facebook advertising, Facebook promotions, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, our website, um, but also more traditional sources of media like um, community radio stations and um, their notice boards and um, it can even involve you know church newsletters um, uh, and the distribution of, of leaflets locally to GP surgeries to physiotherapy practices so quite a quite a multi um, strand approach. And the other thing is that the recruitment and selection of, pro, you know, um, you need recruitment and selection program for leaders. So you need to look at, well, how am I going to get leaders? How am I going to identify suitable people? What criteria am I putting in place to recruit people that will be suitable um, and, will, and can develop the skills to deliver this program um, in the community? So that that requires care and attention as well. And, and in tandem with that, monitoring and support of those leaders is also really important in also in terms of keeping those leaders on board but also in terms of maintaining the quality um of the program as well so next slide yeah so the ski the, the the key skills learned from the program and um, the first thing um would be that uh if you like there's a lot of topics covered over the six weeks of the course but i suppose essential um, amongst those skills that people are introduced to and that they get to practice over the six weeks is this whole area of goal setting and action planning. Um, the second area is all around positive thinking and attitude. So it's about trying to, um, I suppose, work on individuals who may, who may be in a rut of negative thinking and looking at how we can support them to have a more positive attitude towards their condition and their life with that condition. Um, as many of you living with RMGs on this webinar will know that problems um, are come part and parcel of living with any chronic disease and in, in fact every day your path can be strewn with obstacles. So problem solving is one of the, the key tools and skills that people um, practice and learn about on the self-management programme. Um, the other area is around communication skills. So not only communicating with your maybe your healthcare team, your consultants, but also communicating with friends, family uh, and indeed work colleagues. And the last area is decision making. Um, again, living with a chronic condition involves, you know, decision making sometimes on a daily basis. Um, and again, it's something that people are introduced to in terms of a framework for how they they can make decisions um, around their around their disease going forward. So uh, just yeah, um, so in terms of the significant changes that we learned, now we carried out research over a number of years, um, and I'm just kind of giving you some top line things here. You can see the percentages. Um, there's a huge emphasis on physical activity in the program, and in terms of empowering people to become more physically active. And I guess we all know that physical activity is is one of the the most important things um, a person can do when they're living with an RMD. But sometimes, of course, it can be really hard to get started. And particularly if um, you know, you're know you going through a bad patch with your disease, if you're in pain, it can be really hard. Um, however, on our self-management program, there is such an emphasis and people get supported by other members of the group. Um, so, you know, 72% of people on our course reported that they had increased um, the amount of exercise they were doing. You know, 67% of people felt less alone as a result of doing the course. And that was largely about because they, they came to a course and met people that were like them. And it's surprising how prevalent RMDs are in our community, but it's surprising sometimes how many people have never met somebody um, with their disease. Um, 63 percent of people felt they had a more positive attitude and um, they were they could look at their disease in a different way, having done the course. Um, 59 percent of people increased their knowledge of arthritis. So I mentioned that the course isn't actually a disease education course, but what it does promote and empower people to do is to go off and learn more about their particular type of um, arthritis. 
And then half of the people increase their ability to cope with pain. So we know that pain is the number one symptom that people experience. Um, and through the course of the six weeks, people are introduced to various tools um, that they that they practice, that they try out um, to see um, whether it has an impact on their pain. And of course, that is a very personal thing. What works for one person doesn't always work for the other. So people are introduced to a variety of skills. So um, as an organization um, delivering this program, I just wanted to share with you as well, you know, some of the other positive effects that we felt it had on our organization. Um, so, um, so it goes beyond sort of the, the actual course itself, but we, we would have noted a, an ethos of self-management um, really developing and being threaded through all of our services going forward. So be it our information, the approach we might take um, to, on our helpline to, to callers uh, and the way in which we would respond to people and um, the way in which we would um, facilitate and run our support groups and indeed our walking groups as well. We found that a lot of the language, a lot of the thinking from our self-management course started to, to come to bear through, through um, how we would run um, our, our other services as well. We found that course participants became very active um, in our organization as a result. So many people having done the six week course came to us and expressed an interest in becoming a course leader. And indeed, most of our leaders at the moment would be drawn from co previous course participants. Um, I, and then our helpline volunteers. So we have a helpline um, in Arthritis Ireland that runs Monday to Friday. Uh, many of those volunteers came via the course network um, and volunteered. They wanted to give something back and they felt more confident that they could make a difference to people as a result of uh, in, in engaging in the six week intervention in the community. Uh, some of our some of our course participants also became walking leaders. So I saw a, a question Jared just popping up. We have a network of walking groups around the country and um, which are led by people with arthritis who are, have been trained to facilitate small group walks um, in their local community. So many of those became involved as walking leaders and indeed our branch network. So our branch network um, operates on a, um, a regional basis um, and a local basis here throughout Ireland. So they're, they're groups of volunteers that organize local activities and supports for people. Um, and we also found that many people became really positive role models for living with a chronic disease. So they became involved in our peer support network and indeed in mentoring other people who weren't doing so well and needed additional support. Also on the financial front, we found a number of our course participants um, became sustained givers and um, took part in some of our fundraising events and campaigns um, and involved their friends and families as well. So they were all other positive effects that resulted from, from our, our program since 2006. Next slide. So I'm just going to give you a couple of quotes. This is David and David actually is a volunteer on our helpline um, and he came via the course to our helpline um, and he felt, you know, at the time his thing was the key to me was the knowledge I gained. He gained huge knowledge from engaging in the six weeks. And the next person is Anne-Marie. Um, Anne-Marie lives at Rheumatoid Arthritis. She was living with for over 30 years. And by doing the course, you know, she felt it taught me that I was in control of my disease, not the other way around. So that, that's a common thing, actually. Many people report that um, it gave them the ability to feel that they were back a little bit more, that the control was more in their favour, not the other way around. You, many of you might know Peter. Um, for him, as a young person uh, coming to this course, he didn't know anybody else uh, with his condition. So really, it opened him up to a massive network that he could then tap into for further support. And for Claire, my, my co-master trainer, the course reinforced in me the importance of a positive attitude and helped me to set goals and achieve them. OK. Um, since we, we launched our community, um, you know, our courses in the community back in 2006, we also um, developed an online offering. Um, so we, we have, so this is sort of a, it's a non-group based, it's one that you can kind of navigate through yourself, but it has a lot of the um, 
the thinking and the uh, concepts behind the community based self management program weaved into it. So some of you might have heard me presenting on this before at ULAR. So it's an online offering and this was really in an attempt to reach people who maybe couldn't come to a course. Uh, maybe uh, we weren't offering a course in their area. Maybe it just it wasn't possible for them to come out in an evening or during the day and um, for whatever reason. So this uh, this was an opportunity to be to operate to operate a more flexible approach for people who still want to learn about self management. OK, and then I'm going to move on to um, just really addressing the challenges um, of uh, COVID-19. Um, so I'm aware I just have a few more minutes. So I so basically as we all know, um, life changed for all of us in uh, March 2020. Um, and here in Arthritis Ireland, uh, we halted all face to face activities back in March. Um, uh, we were lucky that the Self Management Resource Centre in the States, um, they issued uh, some guidelines for delivering virtually. Now we were kind of almost ahead of it and that we were, you know, we were plunged into thinking straight away, how are we going to um adapt in this new environment where normally most of our services are face to face um, and now we cannot do that however support was needed more than ever and um, so we were inundated with um requests for information clarification questions around COVID-19 so that was a, a huge body of work but then we turned our our minds to how we would adapt our most important service um, to get it out there um, to people um, in need. So we developed new guidelines for delivering what we call virtually. Um, and back in June then, or at the end of May actually, um, we developed and delivered training to leaders. So we felt that if we were going to put this on a virtual platform, the first thing we needed to do was actually to take our leaders back in because all of these leaders had been trained to deliver in a community setting. Um, and we're, we actually don't use any technology in the delivery of those courses. In fact, the SMRC, the Self Management Resource Centre in the States, um, actually uh, preclude us from using laptops, PowerPoint, anything like that in the delivery of a community setting. So it's very much um, old fashioned uh, charts and flip charts that we use for delivery. So we needed to develop and deliver training to our leaders so that they and first and foremost um, could could um, get to grips with, with the technology um, and the way in which they would need to adapt the delivery of the course to this new platform. Um, the other thing we did is that we, we developed IT support for course participants and for our leaders as well. So we quickly recognised that we couldn't deliver this programme on our own um, and figure it all out without IT support. Um, so, um, Although there had been a number of kind of um, concerns kind of earlier in the year about Zoom and the security of it, um, our IT co company actually assured us that this was still the best option for us to use for the purposes of delivering our Living Well with Arthritis program virtually. Um, so then in June 2020, we offered our first virtual courses um, offered on Zoom. Okay. Um, and we've been offering the courses since June and um, we offered them throughout the summer and um, which would not normally be the case. But actually the summer was a very different experience for, for lots of people this year. A lot of people weren't weren't traveling. Certainly in Ireland um, it was very difficult to actually leave the country. So many people didn't. Um, so lots of people engaged with our, our courses over the summer um, and you know Actually, the the experience the experience we had is that people found it uh, less onerous um, than they may have before, or maybe that, that they than they thought by using Zoom. So, for instance, we we conducted a participant survey after the first few courses, and we asked people, did they have experience of using Zoom before the course? And actually, sixty percent of people had. Now, I'd say if you asked that question this time last year, that figure would be a lot lower, but. I'm sure like, like uh, many of you on the call, we've all been using Zoom a lot more, even in our personal lives to, to reach out to family and friends. So almost 60% of people had used it before, which certainly helped it and reduced the need for, for IT support, but we still had it available for participants. The next one there. Um, what type of device did, did you use? So um, most people use a laptop. Um, and actually the, the one thing we learned from this is that 
really it's a laptop or a you know an ipad or a tablet that's that's useful or a pc the one thing that's really not suitable for this is a phone and um, so that does create a barrier for some people but it's just not possible um, to participate in this course um, on a phone. Um, the main reason, and it's not to do with connectivity or anything, but it's actually to do with the fact that we do present, we do share slides every so often. So people need to be able to see that information and you won't be able to see it on a phone. So that's, nor, and nor can you see the other participants in the group. So what we've tried to do um, uh, throughout um, our conversion to a virtual platform is to try and create that sense of a group, a sense of support um, on Zoom. Um, and that's not easily created, but one thing that does make a difference is that we ask people to turn on their cameras um, and we ask people to use, to not use a phone so that they can see the other participants in the group. Um, next slide there. Um, so how did you find your experience of using Zoom? So in the main, people found it a positive experience. Um, um, so there you can see there where um, the, you know, people on the whole rated it, um, rated it highly. Um, and also people found where they needed technical support, they did find that that was, um, you know, we were we were there, we were able to provide it and we were able to get people online. And very often it was something just very basic that people needed help maybe downloading the app. So we, we were able to guide them through that. Um, the question just popped up there. So in the community, we normally uh, would deliver the course to 18 people maximum in a group. When it's online, we've been maxing it out at 12. Um, just because this is a new, um, this is a new way of delivery and um, we don't want to have too many people um, on a screen and um, if you have 12 people you can generally see those people on the screen without having to go into a scrolling bar so um, so that's where we've we've kept it at 12 people so it is a, a lesser number of people so um, next slide there yeah so the findings from the survey so just a few kind of uh, quotes from people. First one there is, I enjoyed doing the course on Zoom and I, as I didn't have to travel at least an hour and a half to go to a course, big consideration, and I would recommend doing the Zoom course in the future. So it certainly enabled us to reach people for whom travel might have ruled it out for them before. And um, I felt it made a huge difference to my quality of life. It was a comfort to hear about people in different similar situations as me who have the same problems I have. I knew I wasn't alone, even though we were all on Zoom and not physically together. So you can see, it, you know, if we have the choice, we'd still run it in the community. But you can see that people still found that they were getting a benefit from from uh, the Zoom. Um, last quote there, the course was such a help in allowing me to cope with my arthritis symptoms, especially when due to COVID, my clinic appointment had been postponed. Um, and being on the course meant that I learned how to use my toolbox to deal and ease with some of my symptoms and even to explain why I may have been experiencing some, some of the symptoms I had. And that was actually a common thing. So, for instance, we, um, you know, we a lot of appointments here in Ireland were cancelled um, and people, if you like, were, were plunged into this uh, thing where they were even more isolated than they were before. So the course kind of was a lifeline to, to many people in terms of being able to get support, but also linking with with other people as well. And then the, the last letter, we've long, that's it. OK. So thank you, Gronia, for that excellent presentation. I think we have now a few minutes to ask some questions. And if I may take the opportunity of asking one question um, out of the two for the two presentations. Um, Claire, I would like to ask about all those apps that you have been mentioning in your presentation. Are they made available free of charge for the clients? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. They're, they're uh, currently all freely available. Right, so there is no financial barrier to their use. Yeah. The uh, for the My Arthritis app for the um, the clinical portal that would mm -hmm. be paid for by the hospital if okay. they wanted to embrace that. So there would be a charge to the hospital if they wanted to participate. But the actual app, the patient portal side of it is free for, for the individual. Excellent. Thank you very much. And well, Gronia, can I ask you about the leaders experience when they had to change from a physical delivery of, a, of the present the, the talk to an online presentation? What were their difficulties there? 
Um, there were some difficulties, so we, we would have reached out to our entire network and asked them, uh, you know, encouraged all of them to come on the training. So um, some were not comfortable doing it. So some really felt that um, they it wasn't for them. So they just weren't. They just felt the technology was a barrier. Um, now, many of them were, were willing to come on the training and see what it was all about. And we would have set them up like that. Uh, but it's funny, a, a few have just said, look, I'm not comfortable. I don't fully believe I can deliver a quality course this way. I'm just not tech savvy. And, you know, it, we've encouraged them. We've offered them support. But where we feel it's a real barrier, you know, we need our leaders to be confident. So if that's really their choice, then we're, we're kind of now we're still working on a few people. The other thing in Ireland is that we wouldn't have broadband everywhere. So there's a few patches. So I, I live in Dublin. I live in the capital. Um, so, you know, it's not an issue for me. However, there are certain parts of Ireland and I'm sure in many of the other countries on, on here as well, where broadband would be a problem. Uh, mm. So that also uh, meant that some people felt they just didn't, they, that, you know, we obviously need the leaders to have good connectivity in order to deliver a course and not be dropping out. So that that was the other consideration and that's not something we can necessarily do something about. Um, so there's, I would say not everybody has converted to delivering um, on the virtual platform, um, but we're 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 working on some as well, you know, and trying to offer them more support to, to see how we can get them more confident. But some, you know, jumped at the chance, and we're 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 already maybe using Zoom in work or whatever, and we're we're comfortable to to try it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kronia. Thank you very much. It was an excellent um, it answered my questions very clearly. I'm looking at the questions on the chat, and it looks like. All of them have been answered already. Can anybody confirm that, please? Uh, sorry, I'm Katie. There is one question regarding working groups. Can you describe uh, Grain a little bit more, please? Oh, the working groups. Um, yeah, we have a. We, I mean, this was really a response, you know, to um, our what we felt was the need to provide physical activity opportunities for people um, with arthritis. So a number of years ago, it's probably about 10 years ago now, we started to set up a number of walking, a, a network of walking groups around the country. So it's basically we have we have walking leaders who have been trained to, um, if you like, facilitate a group and lead people on very basic walks, but also to follow say health and safety protocols to do the appropriate warm up and warm down exercises and um, and it's it's sort of you know so it enables a group of people with arthritis to meet in a local community and to go for a walk and um, so they're getting their physical activity and um, but it's also providing that social interaction um, for people and that's one of the things that people find hugely beneficial as well but it's also the confidence of going out and walking in a group um, now that sort of had to stop a little bit during the height of the lockdown here in Ireland but with our um, our guidelines here at the moment up to 15 people can go walking if they remain socially distanced so we have started up some of those groups again and um, by following the you know relevant protocols. Thank you very much, Gronia. I think that I cannot see any other um, questions that we haven't answered yet. So yeah. can I pass on the floor to Kati so she will conclude this webinar? Thank you. Let me open my, my camera, please. Uh, I'm trying, but we have a cyclone here, so it's very difficult uh, for me. Can I just yes, yes, Ina. We I'm so sorry. This is Diana. We have a couple of more questions. Maybe I can. Uh, yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I just saw that. Okay, okay. Yes, Please go ahead. That. It is uh, about um, the broadband internet access in certain parts of Ireland. This is an issue. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, it is an issue. And um, so, yeah, I mean, that's. Unfortunately, that's one of the things we're we're not really, you know, we can't really do anything about. But there there are certain parts of the country where the broadband wouldn't be good. So it does mean that, you know, we're not a, we're not able to, you know, it means that some of our leaders can't deliver because of where they live, and then it also means that some participants can't participate because of where they live. They just wouldn't have the broadband access. So, you know, um, but we are still able to reach a lot of people. So it's not a it's not endemic in Ireland, but there are certain parts of the country where where it is an issue, yeah. Uh, so, uh, 
There's another That's question this. from Ingrid. Yes, uh, about support. Yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. There's a question from Ingrid asking, how do you support your leaders? Do they get a small allowance? Are transport, there's transportation covered? How, what, what's the support given? Yeah, we, we do. So in terms of financial support, we do pay our leaders a stipend per session or per course that they deliver. Um, so they get a stipend and then the um, the the they do on top of that, then they would get if they're so at the moment, obviously they're delivering from their own homes. So in the normal, um, if they were delivering in a community session, they would get mileage. So they would get a mileage expense, okay. which would be our organizational rate to cover their mileage of using their own car to and from the venue. Um, and then just in terms of other support, um, you know, we would have like we've had a number of, of Zoom catch ups at the moment to get to share, you know, experiences and to um, unpick some of the issues that may have arisen on the virtual courses that we've been running. So we, we've gathered people on Zoom and we go through the issues and um, problem solved, etc. And we're also bringing the leaders to, together to share their experience. So that's just in terms of the other supports that are needed. So it is regular contact with your leaders. Um, you know, um, certainly there, there is also a high cost of training people to, you know, to, to do this course. So you want to keep people on board. You want to people, uh, you want to, you know, it's, it's sort of like dealing with any volunteer or a staff person. You need to have a, a support program in place to ensure that you, um, you know, you, you keep the goodwill on board. Excellent, thank you. There's another question from Mania. She's asking Claire. Claire, you mentioned Fora, accessible 24 hours a day. Is this monitored by a professional? Um, this is uh, when I was talking about the online community forum. Uh, it is monitored by our helpline staff, not 24 hours a day, seven days a week, though, but they do look back on the previous day's uh, posts and make sure that everything is is correct. It's a bit like monitoring Facebook forums as well. You've got to be really careful that it, the information that people are sharing with each other is appropriate. Um, and so it is monitored by our staff, but we also have some expert volunteers who have been given training about monitoring uh, posts online like that. We try not to uh, intervene too much because it is about peer support and self-management. So it's only we would intervene if something was being shared that was totally inappropriate. You know, occasionally we have a little bout of uh, people talking about um, cannabis based products and things like that or and where we we haven't got scientific evidence then we would intervene and say well actually you know while some of you may have found this useful this is not something we would advocate or there is no scientific evidence and we just try and level it out that way but because it's an online community forum we want it to be for those people on the forum and not too much um intervention by us. Thank you, Claire. There's another question for you, please. Can you provide an idea on the average investment when developing an app? Goodness, uh, that is quite a how long is a piece of string sort of question because you can, <laughs> okay. you can, it could be a, a real black hole of how much you invest in these apps. I mean, uh, there was the My Arthritis app that I was talking about the the biggest investment was our time because they had already developed the app for another condition um, uh, and they were then using the same sort of development um, resources to develop it for arthritis. So they were a company, they were hoping to get the, the funding for it from the hospitals. So our, our investment was our time and our um, intellectual property to, to help with supporting of that. With the um, Know Your DAS app, uh, we got pharmaceutical uh, company money to develop that app with developers. But I mean, the, the money that we were talking about, this is some years ago when we first developed it. I think you're talking in the region of about anywhere between 8,000 and 10,000 pounds to really develop a, um, an app to the with the integration and, and the um, being able to actually interrogate the data on a, uh, a population scale. 
but we want to be able to see how people are using the app, not the individual data, but actually, you know, people age 30 are using this app mm. or you know, that sort of thing. And that's where the costs are, are quite, a, you know, and the development of how it interacts and how, you know, if you press this button, this will happen. That development work is, is very, very expensive. So uh, you have to think long and hard, I think, before developing apps. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. I think I have looked through the list and there weren't any more questions, but I stand to be corrected. However, for those who are asking whether the recording will be shared, the answer is yes. It's there in the chat. Kate, can I pass on back to you now? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so, we would like to thank uh, both of our uh, speakers for their excellent presentations. We would like to thank you all of the participants for all of you who participated at our webinar. We would, we would hope that we would like to have another one in the very near future, which I'll let you know. Thank you, Bilder, thank you, Diana, thank you, Claire, thank you, Brainy, and thank you, all of you. Have a nice day.